This begins Gospel, Matthew chapter 22, is a continuation of where we have been in the last few weeks. The Gospel today kind of turns itself around, though, because the last several weeks we've seen Jesus questioning and telling parables about and to the scribes and Pharisees. And he's been really hard on the scribes and Pharisees over the last three weeks about the hardness of their hearts and the way in which they love to uh, be leaders in the community but not actually be converted themselves, to wear the things and, and have the places of honor but not actually be converted in heart and not actually follow uh, God in that deep way. And so today, the scribes and Pharisees, recognizing what Jesus is doing, turn things on their head and they begin to ask him questions, as we've seen in other times throughout the Gospels. It's important to mention also that, I said this a few weeks ago, but just a reminder that where we are at in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is in his final days in Jerusalem. He has entered into Jerusalem, uh, Palm Sunday has taken place, and now they are preparing uh, now they are preparing for Jesus going to his death. And so he's preaching to the scribes and, and Pharisees. And so they ask Jesus the question, and they kind of say this kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man. They don't really care about the kind of man that Jesus is. They're just trying to entrap him. And in order to trap him, they say, Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Because they know that if he doesn't pay the census tax, he's going against the state. If they do pay the census tax, it is, in a sense, going against God and against the temple because they are God's people. And so the tax only goes to God, to God and not to, and not to uh, the state that is occupying them. And Jesus, in his wisdom, of course, being God, knows what they are asking. And he responds by saying, whose image is this? And whose inscription? And everyone knows that on the coin, it's Caesar. If I remember correctly, it was Caesar Tiberius at the time. So Caesar Tiberius, his image was on the coin. And Jesus says, Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. I think that's an important line in our gospel today, a great conclusion in our gospel today. Pay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. So what belongs to Caesar is the due honor that belongs to the state, following the laws of the state, the just laws that the state enforces in order to have a, an ordered society. We have a duty to do that. But we also have a duty to God. And that duty to God and what that looks like, I want to spend the rest of our time on here today. St. Lawrence, uh, Lawrence of Brindisi, a saint from the 17th century, had this to say about this gospel. He says, to each, he says, must be given what belongs to him. This, surely, is a judgment full of heavenly wisdom and instruction, for it teaches that authority is twofold, having an earthly and human aspect and a heavenly and divine aspect. It teaches that we owe a twofold duty of obedience to human laws and to the law of God. The coin bearing Caesar's likeness and inscription must be given to Caesar, and the one stamped with the divine image and likeness must be given to God. We bear the imprint of your glorious face, O Lord. We are made in the image and likeness of God, so you, O Christian, because you are a human being, our gods tribute money, a little coin bearing the image and likeness of the divine emperor. I think that's a beautiful image that St. Lawrence says. So I want to read it again. We are made in the image and likeness of God. So you, O Christian, because you are a human being, our gods tribute money, a little coin bearing the image and likeness of the divine emperor. So what does it mean to be in the divine image of God? What does it mean, this image of who we are? The word used in our gospel today is the word icon. And if we think about what we know about scripture, 
we've heard that word image and likeness used somewhere else. We've heard it used in the book of Genesis, in the very beginning, in the first chapter, to speak about the creation of man. And I think it's important to, when, when we talk about the creation of man, that we don't just talk about it as just Adam or just the male, but when we read in the first chapter of Genesis that the image and likeness is in the creation of male and female, he created them. And they were good. They were very good. In the second chapter of Genesis, then we get the distinguishing factors of the fact that the male was created first. And created first, God says, it's not good that he be alone. And so he creates a helper fit for him. And it's only after the creation of the helper, the female, that is fit for him, that God says it is very good. And so it's in the creation of man and woman together that creation of the human being is very good. This word for image is icon, like when we talk about the painting of an icon. Some people talk about writing an icon, which I, I love that. I love that language, the writing an icon. An icon, when we talk about it in the form of art, is like this one up over here on our wall that is an icon of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. And if you've seen an icon before, an icon tells a story. It's not just a painting. It's not something, be just, it's not just something beautiful to look at. But all of, all of the colors matter. All of the symbols matter. The letters on it all matter because they're telling the story of the image that is in the icon. And so it's a writing, the icon is the telling of the story of what the icon is about. Now, if I knew Greek or Russian, I could tell you about all the letters on there, but I don't. So I used to know some Greek and I've not used it. So it's kind of gone. So when we think about being created in the image and likeness of God, and we think of us being an icon of God, because that's the word that is used, and we think of the icon being in the creation of male and female, and it's that, that's the icon of God, then we ought to ask the question, what does that actually mean? To be in the image and likeness of God, to be an icon of God. And the Catechism says, paragraph 1702, in fact, you have some homework. Go home and read paragraphs 1700 all the way to 1715. Or just read the whole thing. It's all good. 1702. The divine image is present in every man. It shines forth in the communion of persons, in the likeness of the unity of the divine persons among themselves. 1703. Endowed with a spiritual and immortal soul, the human person is the only creature on earth that God has willed for its own sake. From his conception, he is destined for eternal beatitude. 1704. The human person participates in the light and power of the divine spirit. By his reason, he is capable of understanding the order of things established by the creator. By free will, he is capable of directing himself toward his true good. He finds his perfection in seeking and loving what is true and good. All of these three paragraphs, 1702, 03, and 04 in the Catechism, are actually quoting Gaudium et Spes, which is one of the documents from the Second Vatican Council. And what I love about these is they lay out for us what it means to be in the image and likeness of God. To be an icon of God, to be in the image and likeness of God, means that we have a reason. We have reason. We have rationality. We are capable of, the way the Catechism says, we are capable of understanding the order of things established by the Creator. There's no other creature that has been created that is like us in that sense, that can understand how things work, we can understand why things are, why they exist. We can do philosophy. We can do science. We can do mathematics. No other creature can do those things. We have a free will. 
Our free will allows us to take those things that we know by reason, to under, which our reason then helps us to know what is good and to know what is evil, to do the good and to avoid the evil. And when our will is working in union with our reason, when our, our will that is properly formed, when it works in union with our reason that hopefully is also well formed, we choose that which is good and we avoid that which is evil. We seek the good in everything that we do, and we stay away from the evil that we encounter, recognizing that the good is that to which we are created for. And so we have the reason to know what is good, we have the will to choose it, and then we have this thing called the communion of persons, which today we actually celebrate the memorial of St. John Paul II, St. John Paul II, in his Theology of the Body, his Wednesday catechesis that he gave in the beginning of his pontificate, I believe it was over five years, talks about the communion of persons and what this means. This communion of persons, this husband, this male and female coming together, and only in that coming together do we begin to understand, in the male and female together, do we begin to understand what that communion of persons is. That there is a complementarity that exists between male and female, ultimately between husband and wife when they come together and become one body. There is a complementarity that exists in the male and the female that doesn't exist if it's just a male or just a female. St. John Paul II talks about an original, soli- an original solitude that man experienced, that Adam experienced when he was alone. And then there was the original holiness to which we understand they were created, that Adam and Eve were created in, when they were in this perfect harmony with God themselves, each other, and all of creation. This original holiness, this original harmony, this original justice. All of these things that existed before the fall. And this communion of persons is this, is this husband and wife coming together and living in the image and likeness of God. Two people coming together to be like God, to be an icon of God. God himself, who is three persons in one God, coming together to be one God, three persons in one God. It's two persons, husband and wife, coming together. And hopefully, if God allows, that there is a child that comes from that union. This is so fundamental to who we are as humans that it, we can never change it. We can never try to de- redefine what marriage is and what God has instituted. It's not for us to decide. Because of that image and likeness in which we are created of God, marriage is that fundamental institution of, of how we know God and God's goodness, and what God has done for us. It's fundamental to human society. We can't change that. And what's even more beautiful about this whole thing that God has done for us is that being created in his image and likeness, we belong to him. Like Jesus says in our gospel today, repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, repay to God what belongs to God. What belongs to God? We do. We belong to God. We are stamped at the moment of our baptism with an indelible mark. A mark that cannot be erased no matter what we do, cannot be erased. We are stamped by God. We are His. When we are confirmed, once again, we are stamped with an indelible mark that cannot be taken away, that cannot be erased. We are marked for God. We are in His divine image and likeness such that when a child is brought into this world it also is created in the image and likeness of God and we ought not to destroy that child from the moment of conception all the way to its natural end at death it's not ours to play with that kind of institution that God has given us it's not for us to mess with at all It's for us to help and encourage human life in our society, in our world, and the good that human life is. That's what God calls us to. 
That's what Jesus is saying in our gospel today. Repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, to God what belongs to God. Humans, because they are created in his image and likeness, belong to God. Even more so, a child that is baptized or any baptized person belongs to God in a particular way because of that divine image that has been stamped upon their soul, that indelible mark that has been stamped upon their soul. We have that gift. God has given it to us. We must not squander that gift. We must not try to redefine these things that God has defined. It is our duty to come to know how God has defined that, what God has done, and for us to be obedient to that. Interestingly enough, these paragraphs, 1702, 03, and 04, precede then the very part of the catechism that talks about what life in Christ looks like. And that life in Christ is the Beatitudes. And so this divine image that has been stamped upon our souls because of our humanity and also then because of our baptism then is lived out in the Beatitudes. And so God doesn't just say, yeah, you're mine, and then leave us to our own devices. He says, no, this this is how you live it out. And all of that, but I'm going to come and take on human flesh and show you how to live it out. And so Jesus is our model of how to live out this divine image. He is the second person of the Trinity. We are the icon of the Trinity. We have this tremendous dignity that we ought never to waste, that we ought never to take for granted, ever, for anyone. And so much so that we ought to protect it to the best of our ability in whatever way that we can. Protecting these things that are sacred They are sacred because God has defined them and given them to us. We live them out and we return them to our God who has bestowed bestowed them upon us. If you don't have a catechism, get one. Get a catechism. Read those paragraphs from 1700 to 1715. And then you can see the references that take you back to the paragraphs earlier in the Catechism to talk about more of that dignity in which we are created. We are so gifted and blessed by our God. Let us not waste it. Let us not destroy it. Let us not ruin it. But let us live it out as God intends for us to live it out.